You're watching The Chaos Protocol on Transplanar RPG, an all-transgender, people-of-color-led, dark fantasy TTRPG show set in an original, non-colonial, anti-orientalist multiverse. If you like what you see, please consider pledging to our Patreon to support the show and get access to a patron-only after-show, early podcast episodes, GM notes, character sheets, and even the chance for your tabletop OC to cameo in our series. Thank you so much for watching, and enjoy! The Chaos Protocol is a dark fantasy series that may contain content that is triggering for some viewers. Content warnings for this episode include fire, immolation, war, fantasy violence, environmental destruction, pollution, guns as weaponry, complex and complicated relationships, manipulation, romance, flirting, and references to alcohol, nightmares, hallucinations, and visions. Arc 1, Episode 26 as You Ought, from Self-Eulogy of a Martyr by Connie Chong. The attack is sudden and violent. One moment, the ship your mother begrudgingly lent you is humming its merry way over the leaves toward the Raya without a note of trouble, and the next, your ship is catching on fire. Your lookout barely has enough time to choke out PORTSIDE before a flaming, yes, flaming arrow thuds into the manticrow's nest and starts to set it ablaze. The ship in question is a cast iron engine of a boat, heavy, rusted, guttering, loud, pouring gouts and gouts of black smoke into the air, its maw a cloud of thrashing, hewing teeth. Oil dribbles from exhaust pipes poking from its cast iron hull, spraying black ichor over the trembling waves beneath it. Its bite shreds the verdancy to bits in its wake, causing fountains of amber blood to spew from the hapless vegetation caught beneath its tread. The attacking sailors on board are armed to the teeth with fire. Powdered bombs that they chuck with gleeful abandon at your vessel. Flaming arrows like the one that struck the manticrow's nest. Even a massive, prow-mounted catapult loaded with a glass orb filled with alcohol. A piece of cloth stuck into the ammo and ignited on one end with forbidden lighters. As the flames rain down, spreading to the verdancy around you, your crew, the best wild sailors siren song could muster, begin to devolve into panic. Pirates are one thing. Your crew can fight off rogue wanderers. You can fight off anyone who tries their luck. Easy, no question. But fire? You've only ever heard of fire, Amargin. You've never actually seen it, much less been on the receiving end of a coordinated attack, utilizing it with such wild, reckless, irresponsible fervor. As the fire begins to spread and your crew is cast into chaos, Princess Amargin, where are you aboard the ship and what do you do? I am... Uh... I think right under the crow's nest, actually. Mm. And as people start to devolve into panic, and I, I like stump as loud as like a thunderclap for the mm. sailors to like stop moving. Now, listen here. I know not who our enemy is, but I know that you are the finest wild sailors this land has to offer. And if this is where we die, I do not think you want to do it running around like screaming children. Someone go up and make sure that man is okay, and the rest of you with me. Okay, I need you to make a roll to see how successful your rallying cry is. This is fire raining from the heavens. Even though these are trained wild sailors, it is extremely panic inducing. That's either gonna be grace or iron or teeth. Or a different edge you can pitch me based on how you're saying this. I'll do teeth. I have teeth. 
Okay, yeah, you're saying this passionately. What skill are you bringing to the forefront? What? What? Uh, sway? Yeah, that makes sense. Are you using any aspect or an object of yours to help yourself? Um... <laughs> Aspects... No. Objects? Can... <laughs> Can I, can I be, is, is my rank an object, question mark? Oh, so you're pulling rank? You know what? Yeah. I'll give it to you. I'll okay. let you add an extra 1d6 because you are the princess and people are inclined to listen to you. I am going to have to cut two for the okay. amount of fire that's raining down. That means I take out the, for the first two highest. The highest two, yes, after highest. your entire pool is rolled. Oof. Well, uh, after cutting two, that leaves me with two and one. <gasps> no, that's a disaster. Yes. So even though your words are authoritative and you're standing your ground in this moment, there is a moment as everyone pauses on this ship to look at you, and it seems like they might start to listen to you. And then another wave of ignited arrows <laughs> rains down from this marauding ship and catches even more of your vessel on fire and everything goes to hell. People start shouting, people start running amok like serpents with their heads cut off. And in this moment, we get a close in on your face as the flames continue to rage and your skin starts to feel hotter than hot, hotter than a summer's day. Fire has so much heat and it is so close to you and so tangible, Armorjin. What emotion do we see on the surface of your expression. In a very unhinged way, it's curiosity. <laughs> um, because it feels hot. And there's this, this, this panic, everyone else is panicking, but I am so utterly curious to this thing that is like the sun beneath my feet. Mm. Um, Mechanically, I resist fire, resist flame. So I think, okay. I think it is just like everyone else is like panicking and like hurting. And I'm just like, it's like I'm this. It's like the sun is right here. Hmm. So how dangerous could it be? So mm. I'm standing there with this like curiosity and this smirk at these like marauders or whatever these people like, like there's this like they everyone else might be afraid i am not pretending not be afraid i am actively not afraid and i am very curious as what they're trying to do mm. you're looking around observing these marauders looking at the flames that are now consuming the entire half of your ship and hungrily growing toward you the mast is fully ablaze it's like a pillar of light <laughs> lighting up a signal in the middle of the wild sea. And you can see the flame spreading to the vegetation around you. From above, it looks like a plate of pure crimson, crawling, hungry fingers outward. And still, you're not afraid, Amarjan. You only have curiosity. You only have the desire to want to know more. You've only heard tales of the so-called destructive flame. But it is like the sun. It is like warmth. How destructive could it be? And then a tongue of it leaps from the mast onto you and it ignites one sleeve and you feel that heat turn to pain. But something within you shields yourself from the full brunt of the pain. Even as you see wild sailors starting to run past you on fire now, there are members of your crew who are completely lit up and running and screaming and igniting other crates and barrels and other people in their sheer panic of not knowing how to staunch this. You just see your hand lit up like a gauntlet made of fire. I'm gonna have you mark just one uh, because of your resistance, just one box. As you see it eating at the hairs on your skin, you see it eating at your nails, at your own uh, blue, markings wrapped around your forearm and there's just curiosity glinting in your eyes i want to go to one of these marauders are there are they on the ship at all are they on their no ship? 
They are keeping their distance from this ship your mother lent you. But as you cast your gaze outward toward the people who are launching these fiery arrows at you, these flames around you are only growing. The attacks are only mounting. You see the catapult with its glass cannonball filled with alcohol and fire, and you know that if it lets go of the arm and hits your ship, that's it. Even though you're curious, even though you're fearless, there is an objective, logical part of you who has been wild sailing for a long time. You know if that piece of ammunition hits your vessel, you're sunk. And before your very eyes, the catapult is released. The arm is flung forward, and the cannonball, arcing in a perfect slice of violence toward your ship, and then right before it hits the deck, it turns to ash. The cannonball poofs like a firework, flakes of gray dust spilling onto the ship, and then another crop of flames that have ignited the starboard rail also poof into ash, and then the fire eating the mast poofs into ash, and the flames spreading their way across the verdant sea also poof into ash, and your sailors who are ablaze, the flames upon their bodies poof into ash, and the sailors that are attacking you stop attacking, and you see their eyes go wide, their expressions freeze with perfect fear. Even your crew stops shouting at this, their shock dispersing into confusion, hesitation, tentative relief. And then stepping onto your deck, seemingly out of nowhere, is a pale man. His skin is like a curdled ghost. It's not that he fails to absorb light, it's that light actively flees from him. He has a long, wrinkled face, like a prayer sheet that's been crumpled in a fit of rage and then smoothed out apologetically afterward. A crown of grayish-white hair adorns his head far from his brow, situated toward the back of his skull. A vial dangles from a chain around his neck, a vial filled with a sandy white substance. This man is accompanied by a woman. The largest woman you've ever met, eight feet tall, easy, burdened with muscle, her shoulders broader than some areas of your ship itself, it feels. Her hair is a tangled, oil-black mane, and her eyes are as red as chips of arterial blood. The man raises a palm, and the last crop of fire burning down the prow sputters, and crumbles into ash as well. And at that, the attacking sailors bark orders across the deck and start to retreat. And the man cuts his pale, watery gaze across your mother's ship toward you, Armagen, and speaks. Princess, shall I reduce the ashen to rubble as well? Or would you prefer me to spare them. Hmm. Let them go. They know now not to trifle with me. Or you, who might I be speaking to? And this man lowers his hand obligingly as you hear the guttering chomp of this other ship beginning to move out of attacking distance. I am the Baron. This is my friend, Igni. I am a monk. I was passing through the area when I saw smoke and flame. The ashen are growing bolder day by day, no doubt enlivened by the calamities besieging our home. Our home has lost its way. And so I try to enact my own brand of reclamation where I can. Imagine my surprise and delight when I saw I was able to help a scion of the Wild Sea. You know, I do not believe in coincidences. And I walk towards this man like a leopard unsure if they want to attack 
or investigate. And since I do not believe in coincidences, I must ask you, do you mean to help me if I am to do, or are you here to hinder? And the Baron smiles, a thin knife-like smile stretches across his mouth, wrinkling the edges of his face. I, of course, princess, mean to help. I am quite familiar with these waves. There is a spit not far from here where you can dock your ship for repairs, though such an endeavor may take some time given the extent of damage. You are on your way to the Tournament of Heirs, correct? Hmm. Well learned you are. Yes. We should get these sailors to somewhere safe, where they may be treated. Yes, agreed. And, besides, I have much I would love to discuss with you somewhere more... private. I know a tavern upon that spit where we can talk. Well, lead the way. And your friend, you said your name is Igni? I say to Igni. It's the Baron that speaks for her, even as Igni turns to look at you. Yes, her name is Igni. She's not much for talking. I hope oh. you'll understand. That's fine, she's much for looking. <laughs> and Igni quirks an eyebrow and looks at you differently. The purple Octodew is as shady as shady taverns come. Nestled in the corner of some far-flung spit, its four walls decorated with hides, gemstones, and ancient metals dredged from the depths, the Octodew is alive with patrons of all kinds. In one corner, tucked away amongst stacks of forbidden tomes and ancient texts, we see a short, chubby woman with messy black hair, light-starved skin, and bright violet eyes. Her robes are a similar shade of purple, with constellations embedded in silver cinched around the middle with a leather half-corset. This academic peruses her texts through a pair of round reading glasses, completely unbothered by the rowdy environs around her. Indeed, this tavern is mid-brawl, as it always is. Multiple wild sailor crews are clashing. Wine glasses crash against broadwood walls. Rickety tables are flung. Spilled food scuttles across the floor, some literally, and teeth are unseated from gums. In the middle of this violence, we see a striking silhouette of a flowing red leather trench coat and a half-cocked beret. This person brandishes a blade of pure shadow and is slicing through their opponents like they're made of leaves. We glimpse pale skin, long black hair, a pair of fangs, and rose-red lips before she folds back into the fight. But our focus in the purple Octodew isn't the bookish scholar in the corner or the quiet but confident shadow of a fighter. Hello, Patreon OCs. Rather, we pan to a different corner of the Octodew to find Amergen, the Baron, and Igni, nursing their drinks away from the flying plates and spinning kicks of the fight. The Baron is completely unperturbed. Both of his hands are wrapped around a steaming mug of some thick brown mush that smells bitter and strange. As the bedlam rages on, the Baron turns his pale gaze upon you, Amargin. Thank you for humoring me and coming here. The constant violence of this tavern does miracles for disguising sensitive conversations. As promised, a proper introduction of who I am and what I do. I am the Baron. I am a monk. I guide people. I am drawn to those who embark upon journeys of heart and soul. I can tell you are looking for something, Princess. Something that someone close to you has denied your entire life, has insisted you're not ready for. Am I right? When the Baron says heart and soul, uh, I think Armageddon goes from, like, doe-eyed, just fully gawking at Igni, 
not high, like at not not even <laughs> slightly subtle just like just like staring like like drinking her drink looking at igni and the baron says heart and soul and it's the first time that since since we've been sitting here that Imogen like kind of sits up and like looks attentive um hmm well i suppose you are well learned and well trained mm. i am looking for something and i suppose you're saying you're the one who can help me find it <laughs> I'm not so arrogant as to presume I would be the only one that could help you find it, princess. But I am here, and I'm willing to lend a hand. It is my life's calling, my life's purpose. And you, you are already well past of age. And yet you have not been entrusted with everything, have you? I can tell. I will not bore you with the affairs of my mother's court. Oh, please, I would not be bored. But I am on official business for her and for the Wild Sea. And if you are offering to lend me aid when I am without ship and while I haven't heard back from the uh, how the sailors are doing, I'm guessing I'll be without crew. Well, I do have a ship of my own. It's not very large, but Igni and I make do. We just serve as enough crew for it. Yes, just the two of us. You see, I am but a frail old man. As strong as my heart's conviction is, Igni here is my good friend, my confidant, and she keeps me safe. Well, it is good to have people like that you can trust and lean on. Yes, I agree completely. Someone you can trust and lean on. I know that you are headed for the Tournament of Heirs, and I would not wish to dissuade you from that path. But Princess, I must ask, it feels like my duty to ask as someone who guides people to their destiny. Is just doing what your mother tells you to do and waiting for as long as she tells you to wait truly what you want? What I want and what I am to do are two very different things, Baron. What I want is for my people to be safe and happy. What I am to do is go to this tournament and play my role. You mean to ask me, what will I do? Well, that and I uh, finish my drink, you'll have to wait to find out. Now, which way is your ship? And the Baron smiles again. The Baron's ship is old. Older than any vessel you've ever laid your eyes on. It's also strange. It's made from ancient materials you've never heard of. The Baron explains them to you. A hull made of fiberglass, a mast of aluminum, and the sail, yes, there is a sail, how bizarre, is woven from polyester. The names of these substances feel sharp and heavy on your tongue like shrapnel. The Baron claims he dredged this ship from the drowned ten years ago, a relic of a long-forgotten time. Whatever name it once bore is long gone. Now the Baron simply calls it the mission. Armagen, you travel east upon the mission, leaving your crew behind with its ship needing to be repaired back on that far-flung spit. The mission's fiberglass hull, which has been reinforced with more modern chainsaws, cuts through the verdancy with wind-powered muscle. You've never seen a sailboat before, much less ridden in one. The way the polyester catches the gales reminds you of how Abasi's gauntlets fan out to form wings. It's just you and the Baron upon the mission, and of course, the large woman. 
Most of the time, Igni travels with the mission, but occasionally the Baron whispers words to her you don't quite catch, and Igni takes an outrider west or south or north, and she doesn't return for days at a time. The Baron doesn't know this. I'm not sure if you tell him this, but you feel drawn, pulled, guided toward the east, toward the first of your three destined trials. Your mother has always insisted that you weren't ready to undertake these challenges, that you were too headstrong, too confident, too independent. But sailing upon the mission with a pale old man who seems to believe in you, you feel tugged toward the faith that you know you must claim. And so, Four days and three nights after leaving your crew behind and embarking upon the mission, you arrive at the site of the first trial. It is located in the Tangle, within the depths of an ancient temple. The entrance is guarded by a thicket of thorns that part at your arrival. As you approach, you feel something bright and urgent tugging within your chest. You have a gut feeling that these vines would not have parted for anyone else. The trial itself is an obstacle course, but unlike any you have ever faced, vines with thorns the size of longswords and twice as sharp, gnashing ancient plants with pitchers full of bubbling acid, rooms filled with poisonous mist, guardians hewn from stone and wood. At the very end of it, you come face to face with a mirror. Your reflection steps out of it, just as strong as you are, just as capable. The fight is hard, arduous. Every blow you deal upon your enemy, you receive upon yourself twofold. Eventually, you figure out the test. It is a test of resolve. You must be willing to do anything to protect the people you love. And so, your final blow holds nothing back. Your reflection shatters, but you stay standing. The bright, urgent feeling inside of you grows lighter, warmer, and your internal compass points east. It takes you six days to find the second trial. This one is nestled even deeper within the wild sea, down in the depths of the sink and the drown, located in a tangled network of roots that create a stifling, disorienting labyrinth. Just as the first trial tested your resolve, the second tests your insight. You spend four days and four nights in that never-ending maze, darkness pressing in on all sides, strange insects scuttling in the shadows. You fight off beasts and poison, hallucinations and doubt, hunger and thirst. Finally, you figure out the test. You must trust your instincts. You must walk forward, eyes closed into the beckoning shadow under eaves. You do so without fear. And when you open your eyes again, the maze is gone. The feeling inside you grows even warmer and you are pointed farther east. You know where the third trial will take place. Your mother told you when you came of age. The final test takes place at the world tree itself, as it did for her and her mother before her and her mother before her. Any questions you might have had as a curious, headstrong young princess were deftly deflected with the same refrain. One day, you too will embark upon the trials of heart but only when you are ready. We find you now, astride the mission, on your journey to the east in search of the third trial. The exact location of the world tree is a mystery even to you. All you know is that you'll know when you get there. It was this way with the temple and the maze. It will be this way with the tree as well. Igni is sitting on a crate. Her broad shoulders hunched, picking at her nails with a file that she gets down quite short. The Baron is kneeling in front of the midship altar, a little shrine with objects of worship that are strange to you. A vial of ash, a vial of oil, and a vial of ever-sparking but contained fire. The Baron 
like many in the Wild Sea, is religious, though his faith isn't vested in the Verdancy or Leviathans or even his ancestors. It's vested in some cause you've never heard of, and his rituals are different. He insists on praying before meals and all morning on the seventh day of every week. When he prays, he speaks in a sharp, garbled, nasal tongue, and not in any language you've ever heard before. It sounds ancient and violent. Amarjan, how do you pass your time aboard the mission as you sail toward the third trial? I, <laughs> I am leaned on Igni's shoulder. Like, I'm just saying, Igni, I think a little paint job, we could really spruce up this place for him, you know? Mm, I don't know, Amarjan. The Baron doesn't really like changing things. He likes doing things the way they've always been done. Yeah, but it, come on, it's a little drab, right? I'm sure you wouldn't mind. <sighs> Maybe he has <sighs> to have a birthday or something. I don't know. You know, I don't know too much about the Baron, but he did... <sighs> he did save me when I needed saving. And he gave me the strength to protect people now that I lacked in my moment of weakness. So if he doesn't want me to paint this ship, then I won't. Well, I'm the princess, and if I'm going to paint the ship, I'm going to paint the ship. <laughs> paint it with what? Nail polish? There's hardly anything here aside from rations. Well, we'll find something. Well... Here. And Igni raises her nails to show how, like, short she's shorn them down mm -hmm. <laughs> with the file. Mm -hmm. These better? That's better, yes. Okay, excellent. How are, uh, how are you and the Baron getting along? I I'm mean, away for so long so often, but when I come back it seems you two are mostly amicable. I would like for all three of us to get along very well. Like some big happy family. Mm. Maybe. Well, Igni, I'm not, hmm, a people person. You would say, I'm good at making people like me, but if I like other people, it's an entirely different question. The Baron is fine, it just... Something about him makes my teeth itch. Hmm. You think his ritual is strange? I think his entire demeanor is strange. <laughs> This boat is strange. Everything about this is very strange, but he helped you. He helped me. I can't pretend that isn't true, but I also pretend it isn't strange. I used to have my doubts, too, Amarjan. When he first rescued me, I didn't understand these rituals, but I do now. Hmm. He, for all his idiosyncrasies, he is the one who has given me my strength again. I owe him everything. I owe him my life. I would die for him. Well, that's a quite a strong feeling. I'm, mm, I have three people I would die for, so I can understand, but... Who might those people be, if you don't mind me asking? Well, the other scions and my mother. I'm sorry, did you think one was you? <laughs> Obviously not. Well, Igni, I haven't known you that long yet. I'm sure one day I will feel the need to die for you. <laughs> I like you well, fine it's... enough now. And I like you fine enough now too, Sion. As far as Sion's come, you're not so bad. What do you mean? Ah, oh, in a past life I was a pirate. Wrong side of the law. Hmm. Well, you must not have met my mother because you're still here. <laughs> and Igni flips the file around and starts working on her right hand. Amarjan, days pass. A week. Igni is sent out on some quest or other, as usual, leaving just you and the Baron alone. 
Igni is gone for the longest she's ever been gone, a week and a half and counting. As the mission continues eastward, the verdancy begins to transform. Temperate waves of bright green vegetation change into thick, large, bare roots. Leaves give way to stripped branches, thorns replace stems, manticrows perch atop peeling bark, warbling their pitch black death songs. You've heard of this area of the Wild Sea before, the old growth wood. Legends say the wood encircles the entire verdancy. A ring of ancient vegetation that's even older than the Wild Sea itself. An impossibility. And yet, as the mission destructively saws through these tangled roots and vines, you feel it in your bones to be true. The canopy here is old, ancient, certainly more ancient than three mere centuries. It cannot be, and yet it is. About a half day into your travels in the old growth wood, you pick up a scent. Rather, you pick up on the absence of a scent, drifting from the west like crystals of dry snow, ashen flakes. They're borne on a silent breeze, and they catch on your hair, your clothes, the wooden planks of the mission. And then you hear it, a roar, distant but not too far off, much too loud to be a person. You also hear the crack of weaponry, the crying of some great bird. The bare branches of the old growth wood groan and rustle against each other, seeming to warn you of something dangerous and violent happening to the West. Not only that, but there are people in peril. Amrjan, in that moment, what did you do? I run to the edge of the boat and I yell to the Baron, find me, and I jump off and as I'm falling, I say to the Wild Sea, take me there. Mm. As you vanish into the roots without even telling the Baron what you're up to, without asking for permission, you've never asked for permission, you're gone into the thickening mist and the thickening ash drifting in from the west. And upon the ship, the Baron rises from in front of the shrine, his brow knotted together slightly above pale eyes, and he mutters under his breath, Ugh, we're so close. Come back quickly, Amarjan. We're so close. Back on Storm Chaser, the thick plumes of ash settle down around your party as the final words of your story are spoken. Amarjan, what parts of this story, if any, do you carefully omit? I omit how curious I was about the flame. Okay. I don't make it seem like I was afraid and panicked, but I don't talk about standing there just watching, waiting to see what would happen. Okay. Other than that, I think I tell... I think I tell... I'm telling like a bossy. Uh, mm -hmm. and the print, everything, and like everyone else is just there. Like, I'm clearly talking to them. <laughs> to the scions, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, as the last phrase of your adventures leaves your lips, Abasi is the first to react. She runs forward toward you, her arm cocked back, furiously shouting, and then she embraces you in a big, tight hug. Their skin is warm, their pulse hammering against yours from adrenaline. She smells like leather, sunlight, wind, sweat. And then she quickly shoves off, a low flush touching her cheeks. And she points a finger into your chest, looking down at you because yes, she is indeed taller because you're average. How fucking dare you stand me up, princess, a lifelong mission or not. If I wasn't so damn worried about Sayer or that Ashen Leviathan thing coming back, I'd challenge you to a duel right here, right now. Do you know how shitty it would be if your nemesis was just lost forever and you never got to fight them? Do you know how worried I've been? About your nemesis. 
Yeah, about my nemesis. Hmm. Well, I'm sorry for standing you up. But don't worry, I'll make it up to you one day. Uh, one, one day? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> what, when? Hmm? What, when? When, damn it! When, when, when will I what? When, when will you, when will you make it up to me? Because I've been worried sick, mm -hmm. okay? My dad almost died. He was possessed by an oil thing. Okay, that was actually, it was actually really scary, and I thought I'd, I'd lost him forever, and I, I was worried I'd lost you too, so, when are you gonna make it up to me? I, uh, close the distance, and I just put my hand under their chin, and I make them look down at me. Oh, my sweet little bossy. I apologize for standing you up, and I am sorry I was not there to help you with your father. As soon as I am done with what I need to do, I'll make it up to you. Is mm -hmm. that sound good? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. <sighs> That's good. Now, I'm, who are these people? I'm happy you're safe. Uh, these are... This is the crew that I've been traveling with. They've been helping me find you. Obviously, this is Suhyon, and uh, Suhyon, <laughs> I don't know if you noticed, they're really good at hiding in the shadows. Uh, you feel two small slender arms wrapping around your shoulders as they also embrace you, leaning their head down against yours. We missed you, Amarjin. I'm glad you're okay. I am glad you're okay too, my friend. I am sorry if I made you worry. Have you been keeping a bossy calm? I have been trying and failing. Well, that's probably because they aren't listening to you, and I'm sorry. That is exactly why, yes. My words of reassurance have been most adept. Well, you know how they get. Especially when I'm gone for too long. Yes. They get all... charged up. Mm-hmm. One day okay, I don't know! Words. <laughs> you know what? Just, that's enough. This is Zainan. That's Lumira. Right. The unconscious guy over there is Sayer, and this is Sing, his sister. Lumira has the smuggest fucking look on her face right now. <laughs> Zayden is just shooting looks at her. Over. Like we're, I think me and Zayden both have been looking over each other. Like, look at they gay asses. They so yeah, gay. This is, they ain't even yeah. acknowledging it, but they so gay. Oh my god! Like <sighs> the punch literally made Zayden just like fully put his hand on his face and just he was like this is gonna happen i'm not gonna stop this <laughs> it was a <coughs> the the choke gag for me in the like uh, mm. uh, yeah uh-uh mm. is there something the two of you would like to say lumira zainan sing is, is there Good something fight. you would like to say i agree with that one is there something you'd like to say <laughs> uh only only that i'm glad that you're safe mm -hmm. and that we're all here all three of us we're finally here and back yes um, yeah so this is your nemesis about yeah this is my nemesis mm -hmm. nemesis a worthy nemesis i might add I, worthy of me <laughs> i stand sort of like out of abasi's eye shot and i go <laughs> lumeric kisses her teeth so long like all right. Pleasure to make your acquaintance, Amarjan. It is. Is bowing, is that something I should do? Sure, how do, how do you think you should bow? She curtsies. Nope. <laughs> I, uh... She bends forward, like she will go through at least four different bows that she knows of to see. You get through? Problem. I'm like, we don't do that, it's okay. Zayden starts to take refuge in the crate next to him instead of looking at Lumira. Her face, it just like immediate drop, like side eye, like you. So you let me embarrass myself for an extended period of time. You could have just said that from the beginning. I could have. But you, you asked didn't. if you should bow. <clears throat> could have just I... said no. Uh, and this is Amarjan's way of having fun and sometimes flirting. 
I hope that was helpful. Thank you, my friend. Mm. I can hear the me. fuck up and steps back. All right. <laughs> All right. So what I'm hearing is that we have, as we knew, some crossed purposes and some uh, misunderstandings going on. Your friend Igni. Yes, my friend Igni. And the man, I should... Um, perhaps we can just all head that way and... Form They're a, here. Uh, he, well, not here, but they are... And I, like, gesture from the direction... Of, they're somewhere that way. I'm not quite sure how far I traveled. I'm not certain that your, uh, Baron will be very happy to see us. There is a garden that lays in waste now. Due to your friends. And she says friends, like, you can tell that there is venom laced throughout that. Sing steps forward and has a very strong, determined, bright pink gaze. Locks it upon you, Amarjan. You say that the Baron has sent Igni off on various quests over the weeks. I believe we have been witness to one such quest. Just about a week and a half ago or so, we were in the Raya. We went to return Abasi to her home after she left it in search of you, after you no called no showed at the Tournament of Heirs. Now we know why that happened. Now you're here. When Igni arrived upon our reunion, she burned down a sacred garden, as Lumira mentioned, and she almost killed so many of us in that banquet hall. The people you're traveling with, they've been hiding a lot of things from you. Hmm. That makes sense. That's all you have to say. Hold on. Princess. Yes? If you are any measure like your mother, I trust that you are wise. Hmm. What did you think you were doing with the Baron, really? I am taking care of something very important to me and to the Wild Sea. The Baron's helping me do that. What if we do it instead? Then I suppose the Baron, if he is as bad as you say, will continue to track me, which is how I'm sure he found me in the first place, and be in our way. If we play along with his little game, we will be ready for him. I can do what I need to do. You all can make sure you know exactly where he is, instead of guessing where he is maybe tracking us from. And it's done much easier. Hmm. Oh, come on, just how strong can this Baron guy be? He's like an old man, we just kick his ass, right? It's Igni, that's the problem. And Sayer kicked her ass. Huh. Well, he's knocked out right now, which is not great for the fact that he kicked her ass. But he did, and he could do it again. Mm. I say we take the fight to him! He's by himself uh, on the ship. Why don't we just attack him? Oh, no. Sayer is in that. no... He's in no well to fight right now. We need to regroup. I know not of your skills, you two. Um, I just met you. But you, darling, and I look at Abasi, I can tell you right now that you are no match for whatever the Baron is. <laughs> oh, come on, Amarjan. I'm the scion of strength. The mm -hmm. scion of body. He's just and an old you learned dude. from your father who knows what real strength is and where it comes from and so do you it comes from love and it comes from the fact that there are people i'm fighting to protect it comes from my home and it comes from my community and as far as i can tell the baron's alone he doesn't have anyone all he has is igni who i'm sure he's manipulating the hell out of we know he is but, Amarjan, if you say he's more than meets the eye, then I believe you. When I have done what I've come to do, I will deal with the bear myself. And I also ask of you all, if he is being manipulated and this is all correct, that you play nice. She has been very kind to me. 
with all <laughs> due respect, princess, mm -hmm. that same grace that you're asking of us has not been given to those of the Wild Sea. The beings, the inhabitants of that garden have lost everything on a whim. So forgive me if I'm not as lenient and as easy to play nice with someone who has ruined the homes of countless creatures. That's not who I stand for. That's not what I believe in. Would you like to see it done tenfold? I would like I to be the to... cause of it being done tenfold. Mm. If I do not complete what I set out to do, it is not just one garden that is in danger. It is all of them. It is everything. It is you, and it is you, and it is you, and it is you, it is you, it is me. It is all of this. So, you? I understand your convictions, the mayor, was it? I do not think you understand the gravity of the situation. I am not fighting for one fucking garden. Sing steps forward, casting a glance in your direction, Lumira, a reassuring glance, a solid one in her pink eyes. She turns back to you, Amargen. My friend, Lumira, trust me when I say she does understand the gravity of the situation, princess. But I see the burden that's been placed on your shoulders. You don't just carry your own fate in your hands, do you? You carry the fate of your entire world. I can empathize. We need to achieve justice when it comes to Igni. She has done terrible things to the Raya and she must answer for them in some way or the other, but we won't let that cloud our judgment. That I can promise you as well. Thank you, Singh. If anything has really done this, once again, when I have done what I've come to do, I will ensure that she sees a trial and that we figure out what to do with her. And to find the best way to help her, if she has been manipulated in some way, while also seeking justice for what is done. We can do both, and lighter heads can prevail. And whatever vendetta you have, and whatever justice you are seeking, Numera, I've just met you, but I can promise you, Igni is not your real target. It feels like you have some other shit to sort out. We, we all do. But Singh looks at you, Lumira, to speak for yourself as well. Lumira steals her stance, rolls her tongue between her teeth, and she looks no way, shape, or form intimidated by Amrogen and the presence that she carries. And just promise me that I will have a go at whatever needs to be done. As I can play you, nice. As long as you can play nice and you can follow directions, I'll make sure whatever it is you need to work out, you can work out. But whoever it is you failed is not here. Hold on. And I think Lumira gets very, very serious for a second. All pretenses drop. Permission to speak just a tad bit freely, Princess Amarjan. Hmm. No. I'll tell you anyway. You don't know anything about what I have to fix or when, I appreciate your spunk though. Let's just keep it to the mission. You don't psychoanalyze me and I will leave you alone. 
Don't underestimate me. <laughs> Princess. I promise you, Lumera, I do not underestimate you. I've made my calculations and determined. Very, I am very good at this. That, whatever it is you have going on, is not here. Whatever mistakes you've done before are not the mistakes we're dealing with now. No, so I ask, I'm fixing Igni's mistake. I ask you to sit with yourself and decide if one person who was possibly manipulated by a man I saw snuff out fire with his hand is who deserves all this rage or if there's somewhere else it could go. Because I promise you, it will eat you alive. Now, oddly enough that you say the mission, because that is the name of the ship we are looking for. Or rather, the ship we should probably haul ass and get away from, right? Because we've got a ship here. Why don't we just help you get to whatever you're trying to get to on Storm Chaser, which is your mom's ship, which is pretty damn great, by the way. It is a fine ship. I do enjoy it. But I assure you, if the band is an enemy, I want him close rather than far. That makes sense. But, Armagen, please, enlighten us. What is it exactly that you're looking for? You mentioned that you went through two trials. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate? I could. I won't. <laughs> Secretive just like your mother, I see. But this third trial, the location of which, can you at least share that with us? And I look at uh, Lumer and Zion, I can share it with you too. No, no hard feelings, I just met you two. And if supposedly the Baron is someone I shouldn't trust, how do we know we should trust you either? Until I've had my go at you, I'm keeping everyone on arm's length that I didn't grow up with. All right. Psst. That's fair. Uh, problem is, and he points a thumb to Seer, who is unconscious. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I think he's resting nice and square there. I'd rather leave them there, if that's all right. Certainly, of course. So, is the plan to bring the Baron here, have him join us on Storm Chaser? You know, so we have him close at hand, fighting on our home turf, that sort of thing? Or is he just gonna follow us on his little ship? Well, we'll G see when he gets here. Given all the fire that keeps on popping up, I'd rather he and Igni stay off of Storm Chaser. Yeah, I'd rather that too. But Igni hasn't gotten back yet, has she? I mean, she fled the Raya. I don't think she could have made it ahead of us. She wasn't on the mission when I left. Huh. Different mission. And we... We did tell her friend. Oh my god. Come on, Connie! You remember Unadi's character's name? Axel! Axel, <laughs> Axel thank you. <clears throat> and we did tell her friend that she fled west out of the Raya, which is true. That is still true, right, Suhyon? Ah, yes. Igni did not return to the east after leaving the gardens ablaze. She went west. For what reason, I'm not sure. But I am certain that's where she headed. But I am certain that was where she was headed. Interesting. Well, um, and I take the other, I take the two scions, my two friends, like, away from the gaggle of people I don't really know. We are headed for the World Tree. The World Tree? Yes. So the legends are true. It does exist. You're... you're shitting me, right? Tianmu! Yeah? It's not just a fable? Well, I haven't seen it yet, so I can't confirm, but I have seen... I've seen things older than the Wild Sea. That's where I left from when I came to rescue your crew. Huh. Yeah, I've been getting strange feelings 
about this place ever since we started sailing into the old growth wood. Something about our home. It's so much older and more expansive than any of us could have imagined. The band travels with a very peculiar ship, as I mentioned in my story, that he says he found, but it's made with materials I've never heard of. An ancient ship from before the three centuries descended, with the verdancy exploding up out of brackish loam. A ship from the time of Aragnus, perhaps? Perhaps. He's a curious man, but for all ill you speak of, he's been nothing but kind to me, although, let me just say, his vibes are rancid. <laughs> huh. You can say that again. Igni's vibes were rancid, too, for mm. what it's worth. I didn't get the same feel from Igni, but we're different people. Uh, Avasi narrows her gaze at that. She had uh, very much lingered on the anecdotes about you and Igni when you were retelling the story. She just says, you know, when we get a free moment, I'd like to mm. talk to you about the whole Igni thing. Uh, just mm. In terms of how strong you think she was, how tall she was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not that, not that, not that it's, you know, I am literally the side of the body, so. No. Sometimes it's off a show, you know, the muscles. Mm -hmm. It's about how strong you actually really are. Mm. I'm just really saying I probably lift more than she does. <laughs> At least proportionately, you know, to my body weight. One day, Basi, you use your big kid words, and that would be a joyous day for everybody. What does that mean? Don't, Prin, don't tell, don't tell them. What I, means. are you sure? I'm sure. Because I could just say it and I know. we could get this whole thing over with? We could, but then it would not It would be less fun for me. Okay, then. What are the two of you going on about? No. Um, Zion, Sing, and Lumira, I think the three of you can come back now. <laughs> Thank um, you. When we kind of tucked away, Zion just looked to Sing and Lumira, trying to like get them to tuck in for a second. Mm. Yeah, the other two crowd in, and I think maybe the three of you have made your way over to where Sayer is as well, while the Scions were having mm -hmm. a sidebar, just to check in on him and have a bit of privacy by yourself. And while attempting to be very subtle about it, Zainan looks to Sing and then looks to Lumira. Trains is behind some of this. Way down fate touch this world I don't know why how do you know we found something down below um, still sorting it out but there's a mark of the twilight guard here the twilight that's what Morn led us to it was way down, down beneath the tangle and the thrash, in the sink and the drown. Encased in ancient Kreserin. And Zynan, he saw a vision. Stark team long gone. Most of them... Well, I've only ever met two of them. Who? Huh. We'll, uh, we'll get into that. Just keep your ear perked. Whatever's going on here in this, uh, old growth, it might very well be older than the Wild Sea. I would love, and Zynan, like, pats the, the, like, table next to where Sierra is. I would love for him to wake up. I, uh, have some omen questions. Leave that to me. Right. I'll stay on him. Thank you, Lumi. I know that his life is safe in your hands. It's strange. I've never been apart from him like this before, in a real way. I know he's going to be okay because you're taking care of him, but I... And Sing trails off, but both you, Zainan, and you, Lumira, can see in her face that she feels... She is better together with Sayer than apart. 
but she can't quite or is scared to put that into words. It feels too vulnerable. But the way that her pink gaze lingers on her unconscious brother's body, you know that she's distraught without him here in ways that she struggles to voice to him. Umira will walk up to Sing, kind of pull her off over to the side, just between the two of them, and whisper very lowly, just enough for her to hear. I know it feels off for you, without the other half of your weight to this world. But you are fate's chosen. Don't ever forget who you are and what you're capable of. Yes, Sayer is wonderful. But you are who you are because of who you are, Sing. Not part of Sayer, but Sing as a whole. Okay? You always know just what to say, Lumira. And Sing clutches her fingers over the side of her chest with that birthmark, that tattoo, that omen. And she goes on to say, I'm trying to step into that, but I also know, I've always known, that even though I am the chosen one, the chosen one, it feels so lonely. Fate doesn't make mistakes. Seir was made by her too, even if everyone says that he's my shadow. I guess sometimes I just wonder, I just hope, I just wish we could be Sing and Seir, the chosen two. Not just Sing, the chosen one. Well, I don't know if it makes it any better, but that's who you both are to me. My chosen too. <laughs> you are my chosen. Okay? And a flush colors Sing's cheeks underneath those bright pink eyes and she quickly looks away, tucks a strand of pure white hair behind one ear glittering with jewelry. And when she looks back at you, her eyes are bright and blinking. You're my chosen one, too, Lumira. So. So. <clears throat> um, you, I'll stay with Sayer. Yes, yes. You, <laughs> yes. Guys, get that. Yes, we'll go together. do the thing. Yes, we'll go. <clears throat> Lumira scrambles over to Sayer's bedside table and stubs <laughs> her toe on the edge of the bed, like, careful. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. Don't worry about it. You two handle that out there. Amarjan is interesting. Yeah, you and her have some uh, interesting things to talk about. Mm, interesting. Mm. You, uh, you all right? I don't appreciate being psychoanalyzed especially by somebody that i do not know so i mean her mother did it too just through plants so <laughs> plants don't talk as much as she does all right well so i'll leave you to some nice quiet time with this one oh uh let me know we'll, if you need we'll talk me. later yeah yeah and sign in turns and uh, kind of pats the table one more time and goes to sing. Mm. Uh, as you start to reconvene with the scions with sing tagging behind, she pauses for one last time by Lumi's side. Lumira, 
for what it's worth, no one could ever tell you who you are. It's part of what I like so much about you. I think Lumira's cheeks flush. Like, just cherry red right underneath. And uh, she doesn't say anything. She just kind of tucks her hair behind her ear and sits down next to Sayir, grabs his hand, and kind of places it in her lap. And Singh smiles warmly after the two of you and turns her white mane of hair flapping like a cape behind her as she follows Zainan. Back by midship, the three scions, Zainan and Singh, have reconvened. Abasi is pacing a little bit in tight circles. She seems like she's limbering herself up in anticipation of meeting the Baron. And Prin Himsuhyan is standing there completely stock still, ready and at attention as always. So, um, Zainan, was it? Yes, ma'am. I hear tell you're the one who uh, made that target for me. Mm. On the Vive. Yep, that would be me. And he pats inside of his clothes where you can hear him contacting the stock of his rifle. Appreciate it. Well, uh, that was one very fascinating way to finish the job. Yes, well... My nemesis was here. I had to show off a little bit. Mm. It's a <clears throat> good show. Would you say so, Bossy? Would you agree? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, if if you were trying to intimidate me, Amarjan, consider your task failed. But if you were trying to impress me, consider it succeeded. Well, I've never not gotten what I wanted, so I'm glad to hear that. <clears throat> Uh, 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 when, when, <clears throat> when's the Baron getting here? Cause, you know, we should probably make Baron a plan. Time. Yeah. Yeah. Make a plan. Yeah. Make a plan. Yes. Plan. Yes. 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 A, yes. Plan. a plan. A plan. Yes. That is what we need right now. I'm thinking there's no way this guy doesn't know that we know maybe mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. So we're he, but he doesn't know that we know that he knows that we know. Okay, this is a lot of circles. I'm I'm so sorry. I've, I'm so sorry you've been with them without me. How, have have they been behaving? <laughs> yes, we have as much wonderful. as we can. Thank you, thank you, Zainan. I knew I liked you for a reason. So you want to keep the Baron close, and that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know what? You three. Finally together. Mm -hmm. What would you want to do with someone who is trying to unmake your world? <laughs> well... First, I would investigate why they want to unmake my world. And once I figure out why, well, I would see how they enjoy being unmade. Well, Stitch, you research. have... You have me now, says Suhyeon. I just need to make eye contact with him, and then I'll know everything. Hmm. The three of us together are quite efficient, let's say. Stronger than we are apart. That's what I like to hear. That's what my dad taught me. <laughs> so we just okay, need then. to get one good look. I guess what? this is the banquet plan, part two. <laughs> get Suhyun in front of the Baron, in a way that's safe-ish. That will be the issue, I'm sure. Um... If this man is who he, you all say he is and has done these things, then I'm sure he is quite learned in all of our skills. I can't even confirm that he has not already found some way to block Suihan's abilities. I could punch him out, and then we could pry open his unconscious eyes. Again, 
stopped fire with the wave of his hand. I'm not sure <sighs> punching him out is the way to go, dear. Okay, he might have magical powers, but he's still just an old, frail man. Okay, but yes, yes, I get it, I get it, I get it. We'll have to be more careful about this. How about we start with, I introduce all of you, and if nothing pops off, we just play it cool for at least a day or two. I have an ask. Yes. Don't introduce everyone. What do you mean? Yes, Sinan, what do you mean by that? I... I'm hesitant to connect some uh, members of our group, if I'm honest. Which one? And S Sing doesn't say anything, but her eyes dart to Sayur and back at you, Zainan, and realization is starting to sink in for her. Uh, our unconscious crewmate. Well, he's been having some difficulty out here on the Wild Sea. Hmm. What kind? The kind that ignites. Hmm. Curious, you all tell me I shouldn't trust the Bairn. For the exact reason, it sounds like I shouldn't trust your unconscious friend. Zainan looks You can to trust Sayer. She immediately cuts in. Why? His heart is in the right place. He's not trying mm. to. I don't know what the Baron is trying to do, but he's not trying to do the same thing. I know my brother. He's just always had some issues with his powers flaring out in a way that are that's destructive. But he's been working on it. He's been getting better. I'm Even actually better, really proud of him. He accidentally causes destruction. That makes me feel so much better. And to his credit, it's also that I want someone who he can use to counter him. And Sarah is working on it. <laughs> I should put my trust in some unconscious person I've never officially met that you've told me yourself has uncontrollable destructive outbursts, but don't worry, he's working on it. She can and handle him. a bossy puts a hand on your shoulder, Omergen. Omergen. Sayer's my bro. You can trust him. I look- Oh my like, word. I look up at a bossy. It's not fair when you ask me to do things while touching me. You know that. And a small smile creeps across Ibasi's face, and she does not let go of your shoulder. Fine. But if something happens on the point of Ibasi, it's on you to handle your bro. Yeah. I got you. We I do promise. it together. Together. I introduce everyone except your unconscious friend. Figure out a plan to hide your unconscious friend, I suppose. Don't let him wake up and wander oh, around. Oh, the engine room. room. That's a good place. Wait. And Lumira, are I, you okay uh, stowing Sayer in the engine room <laughs> to hide him from the Baron? One moment, one moment. Where the heart is. Wait, the... Right. Okay. This whole Leviathan nonsense nonsense i say like <laughs> disgusted <laughs> where are you from i'm from a spit don't worry about it this sorry i've had enough of large leviathans for today We can handle him. I lean back again. I'd like to hear about this bit you are from sometime. I'll tell you when we're not making a plan to avoid being possibly lit aflame. Right. I introduce most of everyone. People keep their cool, and I look at Abasi, and I also look at Zion and Sing and look towards where Lumira is. And we take it from there. 
Mm -hmm. And on that final flourish of the plan, activity bustles across Storm Chaser. Lumira and Sing, the two of you, help bring Sayer's body below deck and you stow him in a safe, private place that we'll get to at a later point. Above deck, some minimal activity is undertaken to repair the most dire damage dealt to the ship and prep the deck for the arrival of the Baron's vessel. And soon enough, within the half hour, Cutting through what remains of the ash, its chainsaw prow guttering with a strangely quiet hum, is the Baron's ship. You see it coming across the horizon, its fiberglass hull shining dully in the overcast light. Its aluminum mast gleams like a vertical bullet, holding its polyester sails taut against the wind. As the Baron pulls in close within eye distance, all of you see a pale, ghostly wraith of a man with wrinkled, thin skin on the edges of his face and a crown of lusterless hair seated far away from his brow. He's wearing unremarkable, pure white but dusted robes and is clasping his fingers steepled in front of his chest. He looks up over the starboard railing of Storm Chaser as most of your crew, but not all of it, is also above deck to greet him. And as his pale eyes glint in the overcast light, they land first upon Amarjan, and a humorless smile comes across his thin, cracked lips. Ah, Princess Hylian Amarjan, I'm glad to have caught up with you before too much havoc has consumed this part of the Wild Sea and the other two scions of the Verdant Sea. What an immense honor. And he bows deeply, despite what Amarjan has said earlier about these customs not being what the Verdant Sea is used to. And then he straightens back up and looks at Sing, Lumira, and Zainan. Ah, and Strike Team Nova. It's nice to meet you at last. And we're gonna end the session there. So thank you all so much for tuning into this episode of the Chaos Protocol and the Second Stranger. I've been your game master and creative producer, Connie Chong. Find me across the internet at by Connie Chong. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, pronouns are they he and she, I forget if I said that. I'm gonna pass along action sections to Kai. Hi. Okay, hello. I'm Kai. I use he, they, and she pronouns. You can find me on all social media platforms as Estelle of Imladris. I'm also deeply confused right now. Um, I've had a wonderful time playing Dad, aka Zynan. Um, and uh, I'm gonna bounce it over to Sam. Hi. Sam here. She, they, occasional fey pronouns. Words will come to me, um, cause I've done this plenty of times already. Uh, yeah. I was Lumira. I'm fucked up right now. You can find me on the internet at Lust for Life X. It's in the chat. I'm not gonna spell it out this time. Just click it. Boss. <laughs> I'm gonna pass things over to Austin, our incredible special NPC guest star. Woo! The princess herself. Austin, where can people find you? What are you up to? Uh, hey, what's up? My name is Austin. My pronouns are he, they, she. I just got to playing Armagen. His pronouns are she, they. Me, Austin, on the real world is an award winning game writer, designer, performer, and friend. You can find me everyone on the internet. I want to be found at Sailor's Can Austin. That's at Sailor SCT Austin. I had a mouthful of apple juice when you finished that so quickly. Uh, thank you so much for coming and watching our stream, everybody. That was so much fun. And thank you for tuning in after our week long absence because of Big Bad Con. But we're back, we're badder, and we're more chaotic and queer than ever. Tune in next Saturday, same time, same place, 8 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time on Twitch for the next installment of this uh, Arc 1. We're coming to an end on Arc 1. It is our third final episode next week. So tell your friends. Tell your family, tell your dog, your cat, your parakeet about 
the grand finale coming up for arc one. We have three episodes left, three streams left. Uh, it's gonna, <laughs> yeah, not ready. I have got shit planned as a game master. Uh, and with that, we're gonna read something really awesome right now, no doubt. Much love to you all. Have a wonderful rest of your evening and Spisho, Spisho.